Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming back after lunch. Congratulations, Don. Sorry it wasn't a Mega Millions ticket, but uh, good job. Um, so I'm a chemist by trade, PhD in organic chemistry, background in biochemistry as well. And I thought I'd talk a little bit from a molecular perspective, um, what we're seeing in the marketplace. In 2010, we started as an analytical testing lab, providing independent testing services in California. And through that, we certainly learned a whole deal, a uh, great deal, about what was in each of the cannabis products, what's not supposed to be in them as well. Um, and finally, we're starting to see legislated and regulated testing that is mandatory in the state of California, um, which is a, a great, wonderful thing because there certainly are a number of contaminants that we need to concern ourselves with, especially when providing patient medicines uh, as these are uh, today. So I think most of us in the crowd are relatively well aware that there are a lot of molecules in cannabis. It's certainly one of the things that excited me as a chemist uh, and as a medical purveyor to say there are a lot of tools that could be provided to doctors, to the medical community, and lots of options that could be provided to patients. Um, the last count that I had heard was it's around you know 1,270 different chemicals are known to be present in and on cannabis. The plant itself makes some, others are degradants through natural degradation processes and other metabolic path pathways as well. Um, there are around 144 different cannabinoids, the cannabinoid acids being the ones that the plant produces itself and the neutral cannabinoids being the ones that are degraded from heat. Um, terpenes and terpenoids were something when we first started in 2010 that most people uh, had never really heard of in the general lexicon. And I think what we did in 2011 was begin offering testing for terpenes and terpene profiling and gave that test away for a few months so that people would see the importance of it. Uh, fortunately, today, we can see that almost everyone wants to talk about terpenes. It's very terpy. There's a lot of terp sauce out there, um, which is entertaining to me as a scientist. Um, but it's a good sign that everyone's talking about them. Because a lot of the magic that comes from cannabis and what makes it much more useful as a medicine than other types of therapeutic approaches are that it has this host of molecules to offer all at once. Not only a single molecule type perspective, so it's not one lock and one key, it's many, many uh, molecules being offered to the body and allowing the body to in intelligently select which ones may be most useful to it. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are very, very safe to the body. So what we see in most of the cannabis products um, are typical ratios that you hear of the major cannabinoids, THCA, THC, CBD, uh, predominantly reported as THC and CBD ratios, um, but the plant again makes THC acids. And you see every, you know, most types of ratios, one to one, two to one, three to one, three to two, uh, and greater than 15 or 20 to one of a predominant cannabinoid and many minor cannabinoids as well. The plant ratios are much more restricted than what you can get from products that are produced. So extracted products, processed products, you can blend those ratios virtually to anything you could imagine. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more of that approach as we got license holders being able to manufacture in consistent basis and they can produce these standardized ratios. Um, we're also seeing, as I said, more reporting about terpenes and terpenoids. Um, the prominent ones are limonene, myrcene, caryophylline, the pinenes, and linalool. Um, and those are, I believe, driving a lot of the therapeutic and medicinal effects of the cannabinoids and making the cannabis composition, what we like to refer to it as, much more effective than just one cannabinoid or one terpene by itself. Um, I like the word ensemble effect. I know entourage effect has been popularized, but ensemble makes us think of all of them at once. It's not just one molecule and a bunch of other little players, but they're all important, making that all important cannabis composition. I think there's a lot of data that says there's some utility for single molecules. We see those medicines in Marinol and Epidiolex. Uh, I heard a great presentation from Alice earlier today on Epidiolex. And putting more than one together is Sativex, and that seems to be very therapeutically effective as well for some. But when you can add many, many more of them, you start to see a broader-based utility, broader-based efficaciousness, and much greater you know, response from a broad patient population. So there's been some good work out of Israel from Ruth Galili that demonstrated CBD by itself was not as therapeutically effective as a whole plant spectrum or a cannabis concentrate containing CBD. 
Um, now, a lot of the times these concentrates or other products are not well classified or characterized, and it can be difficult from a research perspective to really know all of the molecules that are in there. Uh, and I believe we'll hear more from Didi Mary about that. Uh, he's been doing a great deal of work in that respect. All of the molecules are what makes this really important, leading to a great synergistic factor. Like one plus one does not equal two, it equals more than that for some reasons. We have the further complexity with cannabis products in that it's not just one product, right? So the regulator would love to think it's just cannabis, <laughs> um, but I think everybody that knows these products knows that there are a large plethora of product types from plant material to concentrated forms, and then all the derivative products that can come from concentrates. Add to that that you can take them in a variety of different ways, from inhalation to oral consumption, topicals, and even sublinguals. So we have a large kind of panacea of opportunity, but with that complexity comes the challenge of finding what's right for which patient. We demonstrated in 2015 and published uh, this in the Natural Products Chemistry and Research Journal um, that chemotyping is going to be exceptionally important to understanding which medicines and product types we're giving to which patients and when. So if we don't understand the compositions and what we're giving to the patients, we're never going to have a good medical dialogue or one that explains which molecules or sets of molecules are most important for which therapeutic effects when delivered in which specific fashions. Um, so we've done this work, a lot of others have done similar types of work, and I think we're starting to see at least the scientific community talk more about chemotyping, which chemovars do we have, and how understanding just a, a cultivar name, such as OG Kush, Trainwreck, or something of that type, doesn't necessarily represent which types of molecules are present. Similarly, indica, sativa, hybrid doesn't represent which molecules are present either. So we do this in 2015, I think we're making great progress, and lo and behold, two weeks ago, I see this headline. Still more evidence that all of it's the same. Um, that was rather frustrating. Uh, thank you, Vice Media, for that one. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there was a bunch of community comments. They went back and corrected the article a little bit and tried to clarify that, you know, there are some differences. Sorry, I didn't mean to say it was all the same. Um, this had happened actually before 2015 as well. But this article didn't comment much at all about terpenes, which we know are great differentiators to the products. Um, our data clearly showed that terpenes were major differentiators in looking at the cultivars and looking at the different compositions. And, and I believe it's very important that we look at more than just the cannabinoids or just a few molecules. We have to look at many to classify these in, in the proper fashion. What our data demonstrated was the indica sativa designation is great for plant morphology, but not for which chemicals are present, nor which physiological effects you could expect from those types of molecules being present. And we really need to move towards this chemotyping classification system. And I think it's going to take the broader community and all of us working together to really assess the best way of doing that so that we all don't lose our minds, because it's very complicated. There's a large number of possibilities and a lot of different ways that you might look at that. And we're going to have to keep it simple enough to communicate on a very easy fashion and really to explain to patients and lay people who are not science driven what they're taking and how to find the right medicines for them. Um, and that is certainly going to be a big challenge. So it's not quite so bad when you look at just the plant and which molecules are present on the plant. But what happens um, often and what we're now seeing, uh, we were just talking earlier, that there are about 30% of the products present in Colorado are in flower or plant matter form. The other products are concentrates, extracts, or derivatives from those products. So it really matters what's happening to all the molecules in that plant composition as I start to process it. How is that product produced and made? What is the fate of terpenes or other types of volatile molecules as I go through this manufacturing process? Um, and really, there are a large number of ways that we might extract or process the plant material. So some of the predominant ones are listed there, water-based methods, um, rosin pressing is another example, hydrocarbon extraction, alcohol extraction, or CO2-based methods. So I quite often hear the whole plant extractions. Um, well, if I needed the whole plant, why did I bother putting in the extractor? I'll just take the whole plant, press it in a pill like I had, and keep the whole plant in my hand. Um, what we hear that were full spectrum, whole plant, I've got all the molecules after I extracted it. Now, no one here should believe that they've just left cellulose behind in the 
extractor and kept everything else. Um, we really lose a large number of molecules through the extraction process, and they really change in composition as I go through that processing methodology. If I'm winterizing, it's the process of adding ethanol, cooling the, uh, the mixture down so fats and waxes precipitate, filtering them off, and then evaporating the ethanol. And as I evaporate the ethanol, I'm also evaporating most of the terpenes because they're of a similar uh, boiling point and are light volatile molecules as well. So I always ask the question, did you winterize? How do you have all of the terpenes? And then I get the crazy look of what am I talking about? The problem is most of them are not testing for terpenes or broader base composition profiles after they do their manufacturing methods. So we're still left with a lot of strain names or cultivar names in concentrated products saying, I used jack hair in my extractor, so I have a jack hair concentrate. But we don't even know how to clearly define or classify a jack hair concentrate unless we are to say this many molecules makes up that composition when they're all in these ratios, then we can go ahead and define them in that fashion. Um, and that from a testing perspective, we do not see uh, broader based uh, and really accurate perspectives given to the concentrates in a sense of which other terpenes or secondary molecules might be present in addition to the cannabinoids. Fortunately, California regulations and laws are going to force the California market to test and report their terpene compositions if they're going to market them and put them on their products and on their label. Um, one way that you can go about standardizing concentrates is the, the fashion that we're taking, analyzing plant material, understanding which components are present, and then rebuilding that composition through individual ingredients to create a complex formulation that can be standardized, consistent, reproducible, and then add that to um, concentrates. And as concentrates reach higher purity, single molecule isolates are now available, such as CBD or THC acid in high purity. You can create create highly complex cannabis compositions that are standardized and reproducible even at scale. And I think that what we have seen, we've been doing this type of work since 2014, filed uh, provisional patents in 2013 on these methodologies, really demonstrates to us that the cannabinoids can all be the same, but I can put 10 different terpene mixtures together and see 10 different physiological responses. So I think terpenes are significant drivers to the overall ensemble or entourage effect. And I really believe that holds a lot of the magic of cannabis and why we're all here talking about cannabis compositions instead of single molecule isolates as much. We think it's the next step in that is really labeling and properly informing the consumers and patients as well as the medical community and the regulator. So we've come up with some names, uh, native, inspired, and emboldened to try and define which chemicals are being present in those standardized formulations and how close to the plant or other types of agents that you might add for flavor enhancement or even physiological effect enhancements. It's going to be the next generation, I think, of what we tackle with regulators to help inform everybody in a proper fashion because a good label is really what helps drive consumer protection and safety. Standardizing those products, especially in concentrate forms, then allows you to standardize all of your delivery platforms. So I described their inhalation. We use that a lot in vape carts. It's also very prevalent for us in tinctures, tablets, topicals, and other derivative products. Once you have a concentrate that is very standardized, then you can start to use that in a medical delivery fashion, such as a tablet or a tincture, and really have a good dialogue with patients who will be confident that their responses will be consistent. So then we can start to get solid, titratable regimens. We can understand the composition because it's well characterized, up to almost 70 different molecules that you know are present, which ones at which ratios and high amounts or low amounts, and what's starting to drive these preferred medical effects. It's interesting, and I think we still have yet to see how individualized might cannabis get. Do we have one composition for one patient? That's very possible. We might have cases like that. Which compositions might drive 80, you know, 50 percent or large majorities of the market? And which ones do we want to then move into the clinic so that we can issue that as standardized medical platforms as well? Tinctures, edibles, tablets, topicals, don't suffer the same fate as inhalation. I don't have to worry about heating or other types of things in an airstream. Um, I know exactly what I'm giving to the patient via those delivery platforms. And Dr. Deb Kimless talked about a tablet composition yesterday. I think we're going to see more of those offered in medical states. Um, we've seen anti-plant uh, perspectives on the East Coast from some regulators. 
Uh, I do believe you can standardize plant compositions and use those for vaporization and inhalation. Inhalation offers different metabolic profiles than oral consumption, and we really should be open-minded and broad-based in our approach to saying what's right for which patients and what's best for each individual patient. But it will be a little easier, perhaps, to standardize some other derivative forms than the plant material itself. Three minutes. And I think what is repeatable is very important, right? So as we talk about delivering the same product to the same patient populations, how do we know that they're also using it the same at home? Um, what's on the labels? Which product types are they getting? So if you're doctors, are they getting a standardized medical product? Are they getting it via a prescription? Are they just getting something in the adult use markets? What are those label specifications and how tightly controlled might those compositions be? We know this medicine is very effective for many. We know it's relatively safe. It's got a broad-based safety profile. What else goes along with it comes from better testing to make sure its purity is proper. And I think we can really deliver a lot of interesting medic medicines from just the cannabis products itself. Um, and I, my, my goal, and I think everyone's goal should be, what is the minimum effective dose? Put the med back in medicine. Um, we're not trying to overdo it here at all. So it's exceptionally complex. I like the potential energy surface here, thinking about where exactly might each patient lie? How do I find the right little square for each individual patient? And how do I get them to find that as quickly as possible? How do I not get stuck on the top of the hill or in some place that's kind of effective? How do I find the most effective means of getting them there as quickly as possible? When we define compositions in a broad-based fashion, we can pick either ends of the spectrum and kind of start funneling them down to their desired medicines. It should be a relatively short period of trial and error that they actually get there. But the honest conversation is, there's gonna be an iterative process with you patient to finding the right medicine and form for you. It's not that this indica is gonna deliver this and this sativa is gonna deliver that, so pick one of those. I think we have to move away from that conversation and really advance our methodologies and language so that we can explain which is gonna be right for them. And I, I think what's coming in the near future is the rise of the next cannabinoids, novel cannabinoids, um, and things such as the one that I've highlighted here, Delta-8 THC. Uh, we have manufacturing methodologies to create high purity Delta-8 THC. We also see other versions of Delta-8 THC on the marketplace, and we're seeing them with uh, significant impurity profiles. So there's an overlay of the chromatograms on there. You see large unknowns uh, in addition to some Delta-8. So again, what's the purity? How am I introducing that? And how might I utilize that in a medical fashion? I think we're going to start to see more and more cannabinoids as more methodologies are developed. Um, and our goal is to license these technologies to medical purveyors, brand builders, and groups that would like to take them into the clinic so that we can standardize this medicine in the most effective way for patients. Thank you.